know if you remember this or not, but uh, last fall, we went 12 weeks through uh, 1 Peter, and the, 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 the title of that series was called Anchored. All right, so I want us to understand uh, the relationship between these two letters by the same author uh, to the same people or at minimum the same region of people. And, and if you think with me, uh, this idea of being anchored into Christ, and now Peter is saying almost in his uh, last will and testament, the final words before Peter's death, he is writing this to say, now that you have been anchored in Christ, it is time to grow deeper in your faith. That is where he begins um, this book. That's where he begins, 2 Peter's, the idea of growing deeper in our faith with Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. There are several things to love about the city of Tyler. Okay, and I realize that it is known as the Rose City, but I'm going to tell you um, the azaleas are absolutely incredible. All right, anybody, have you ever been on the azalea trail? Anyone out there? Okay. Um, I, I'm just going to tell you this, this uh, a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, but um, I was uh, praying before like the beginning of the opening of the Azalea Trails um, at this, the grand opening. I can't remember what they call it exactly, but uh, it was at Miss Joan Pyron's garden at her house. And I'm telling you, this garden is absolutely incredible. I think the the folks who are running Augusta National, they need to come and talk with Miss Joan about what she's doing to make her azalea so pretty. All right, but I was sitting there praying, and and I was looking after it was all over. I was looking, and I got this spring in my step, all right, no pun intended. uh, But I got this spring in my step, and I was saying to myself, you know what? My house needs to look like this. My yard needs to look like this. But if any of you know me, okay, you can ask my wife. uh, When I take on a project, nothing gets better. It only gets worse. All right, and so I have this brilliant idea. I'm going to go to the local market, and I'm going to get some azaleas. All right, it's a big orange Home Depot. I don't know if you ever heard of that place, but I got some uh, azaleas, and I start digging in my yard. Here's the problem. All right, so we had some crepe myrtles. And right, these crepe myrtles, they have um, 1.876 trillion miles of root system all over your yard, okay? You cannot get rid of those jokers. They keep coming up no matter what you try to do. And so I'm sitting there and I have my hatchet. I mean, I'm going like straight man up on these things. All right, I'm just, I got my hatchet. I mean, I'm going through these roots, okay, and taking care of the roots. I'm digging, and I'm just like, man, this is, this is real work. This is good, all right? I'm feeling good about myself. Well, the, the hatchet that I had is pretty old, hasn't been sharpened in years, and so I'm just beating the tar out of these, th- these roots, and they are just not cutting, and I'm just, uh, it's just not working. My poor neighbor looks at me realizes that I'm not a real man with a bunch of tools, I guess. And he says, hey, man, do you want to borrow my Sawzall? And I was like, now, now you're talking my language, right? And so I get this guy's Sawzall, and those things, they cut through anything. Listen, in the fire department, you can cut through an entire car in about three minutes with a Sawzall. It's awesome. Well, I take this to my yard, and those things cut through anything, especially your irrigation lines, all right? <laughs> I mean, like butter, sink right through there. And I didn't, go through the, I didn't go through my irrigation line one time. I went through it twice. I literally cut through it so great that I just pulled the piece of pipe out of the ground just like this. Uh, and I was like, well, here we go again, okay? And so um, then I got some real adult supervision, finished the job, okay? Uh, but it's interesting to me because I was thinking about the, the, the intricacy of these roots. You know, people have told me, they say, listen, if, if you mess up the root ball when transporting a plant or transplanting a, a tree or a shrub, that it has an 80% uh, rate of fatality. It has an 80% death rate if you disturb the root ball or mess it up. Don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but here's what I do know is that God designed the the root system in such a way that the very first root to go down is the anchor point of that plant. The very first one. 
And then from there, the rest of those roots, the 1.89 trillion miles of roots that are going through your yard, those are going to increase nutrients to supply and sustain the growth of the plant or of the tree. You see, it's the same thing that Peter gets at when he's talking about this difference of being anchored and growing deep in our faith. And so if you have your Bible, I want to just invite you to open it to 2 Peter chapter 1, and then if you would, stand with us as we read. And as you're standing, I, before we read the passage, this is my goal for the day. All right, my goal is that we are going to see four things that will enable us to have a deeper faith in Christ that will produce an endurance in our faith, get this, that will never fail. See if you can hear what Peter says. Verse 1 says, Simeon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith equal to ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." The, pro the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing uh, from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. Let's pray. God, we ask you now, Jesus that you would speak to us in ways that only your spirit can. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. You may be seated once again. So Peter is writing this letter closely on the heels of 1 Peter, but we know it's around AD 66, and it, which is, by the way, about a year before his death which historians tell us that Peter died by crucifixion, but he didn't want to be crucified like Jesus, and so he was crucified upside down. And now we don't see that in Scripture. That's just what we see from historical accounts uh, surrounding that time period. But here's what we do know is that uh, most likely, and many scholars believe, that Peter is writing this, um, this letter specifically from prison in Rome. And what that means is that he knows that his death is imminent. He knows that at any moment the Roman guards could come down uh, toward his cell where they're holding him hostage. They're going to take him away. They're going to put him before a trial that is unjust and is simply a sham. And then they are going to put him to death of some way, most likely crucifixion. But we remember during this time that Nero is just making sport of killing Christians. He's putting them on crosses. He's burning them. He's letting uh, animals come and devour them. And Peter knows that this is the reality. And in his final words, he talks about growing deeper. Because how could you ever stand against the world? How could you ever stand firm in your faith unless you are not only anchored, but you are in intently growing deeper in your faith. Peter knew this. Peter knew that at, in the end times, and he says this in, the, in this book, he says in 2 Peter, he says, listen, it's only getting worse. Uh, like in these last days, things are only getting worse. And I don't know if you've recognized this or not, but, but people aren't necessarily rallying around truth right now. 
In our culture, people don't rally around the one who is standing firm in their faith. They're standing and rallying around the person who is going absolute crazy, the person who is going away from truth, away from God's design, away from God's word. That's where the world rallies. This is a rallying point for the world. And Peter knows this. In the last days, it's only going to increase. False teachers, false prophets, all of these things are going to increase. And whereas First Peter, the, the backdrop of that was this warning against the persecution coming from external, this outside pressure from the Roman authorities, from Nero, and now he's concentrating, he's kind of turned the page, still with the backdrop of persecution, but now understanding, listen, now I need to warn you against division within you caused by false teachers, caused by false prophets, caused by these wolves that dress up like sheep. And he says, listen, it's only going to increase. Every time, this is what it looks like. Listen, when you have a movement of God, you know what moves with it? The movement of Satan, the movement of the enemy against it. And so Peter's warning is, listen, there is going to be a powerful move of God. Listen, rest assured, it's going to continue, but with it is an increased move of every demonic being, every evil spirit, every attack of the enemy is going to increase in it. Therefore, you must increase in your faith all the more. You must grow deeper. How could we ever do that? Like when we think about growing in our faith, we think about growing deeper. How does this even begin? How does this even start? Well, first, you have to have the right faith. The, the right faith is the one that is confirmed by the Lord. If you recognize in the way that Peter opens up this epistle and this, uh, this letter, he says in verse 1, he says, Simeon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith equal to ours, equal to ours, most likely he's talking about the apostles, and which means that, listen, you can have the same faith from the same God from the apostles. He's, he is saying this to all believers. Listen, there is not a less than faith because there is not a less than God. The same God yesterday, we just sang about this, is the same God today. The same uh, recipient, the, the way in which you receive this faith is the same way from all of, the, of time. And so uh, Peter is reminding us of, the, of this. He's saying, listen, equal to ours, um, then he says, uh, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there is only one faith because there is only one God. And he's saying that this is what it looks like. It has to be confirmed and given to you by Jesus Christ himself, that it is a gift of God to you. It is nothing that you can earn. It is nothing that you can conjure up in your own power or, or try to manufacture on your own. This is something that only comes from God himself. I don't know if you realize this or not, but our English word faith comes from the Latin word fides, which means to trust or to rely upon something or someone. And so when we talk about faith, we're not just talking about a growing measure of our salvation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a growing measure, a faculty of where we trust in something or someone. It is a trust that we must have, and our trust must grow deeper and deeper with God himself. But it can only be done if it is the faith that is from Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because our faith doesn't need to just be confirmed by the Lord. It has to be empowered from the Lord. I mean, when you think about this, I mean, Peter tells us, he says that you have been empowered by God himself. You know, it, the sun is the closest star to earth. It's 93 million, million miles away. But if the sun were to move one way or the other, there is absolutely no life here on earth. All right, and so think about the magnitude of the sun. Think about the importance of the sun. If the sun ceases to exist, then there is absolutely no life here on earth, Peter is saying in the same way in verse three, it says, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Now, if you think about this, 
If you think about this, in the same way that the sun provides uh, energy and life here on earth, Peter is saying, but with greater emphasis, that apart from Jesus Christ, you have no power, you have no life. The believer is empowered by the Spirit of God himself. And he says that everything that you need for life and godliness is given to you by God. You see, a true faith is a faith that is given to you by Christ, and it is one that is empowered by that same Christ, by that same God. The gift from God, and it is empowered by God. But what does this mean? If you have power, if you have been empowered to do something, then the only thing that would follow is an action. For the follower of Jesus, this action If we are seen to be empowered by the Spirit, what others will see is an obedience from his followers. See, our faith is obedient. You see, we don't just have a faith that we conjure up or manufacture. We don't have a faith that is just uh, empty of power. We have a faith that is confirmed by God himself. It is empowered by God himself so that we can obey the Lord. It gives us the power to walk in an obedience with God himself. Now, I want you to notice this of what it says. Um, In verse five, it says, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. You see what Peter does is he gives us seven unique things that should describe the way that you and I live our lives, and it is a life of obedience. But here's what is interesting is that it has this word, it says, so that you can supplement or add to your faith. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems really strange that Peter would follow up with us supplementing our faith after saying that you have been empowered to, for life and godliness, all the power you need, but in order to add to it, this is what you do. How are we to add anything to everything? How can we add one ounce of faith when Christ has given us by his power all the faith that we should ever have or need? Well, what he's saying is, is that when you have a true faith in Christ, you have a cooperation with Christ, that you have this unity with Christ, that it's not just that you have been saved, but now you have been saved unto good works on behalf of Christ. This is a faith that is seen as our obedience to him. I don't know if you've ever read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. But Peter is the one who started this because he gave us seven habits of highly faithful people, highly faithful believers. And these habits should be known among you and I because you have all the power you need to accomplish these habits. You see, when we think about being obedient in Christ, When we think about having the power of Christ in us, I don't know of any person, I have never talked to a disciple or follower of Jesus that said, you know what, I could use a little less power of God. I've never met that person. I've never met anybody that said, you know what, man, I really lived out all the power that Jesus gave me today. I mean, I've I've just never met that person. But the truth of the matter is, is that you do have all of God's power in you if you have given your life to Jesus. If you have been saved by him, then you have been indwelled by him. If you have been indwelled by him, then you have been empowered by him for this obedience. But to supplement our faith, what this means is that you have all of the spirit of God, but in our act of obedience to supplement our faith, now the spirit of God has all of us. You see, that's the difference here. It's not that you are uh, acquiring something. You're not earning something. We've already determined this is a gift from God, that you cannot earn this on your own. But we supplement and we add to our faith every time we walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. This may be the one barrier in your life that is stunting your growth in Jesus. 
is just simply a lack of obedience. Every step of obedience is further feeling of the power of God in you. The more you act, the more you yield to the spirit of God, the more the spirit has of you, this is how this works. This is how we are supplementing and adding to our faith. You have all of the faith in salvation. You see, this is not what Peter is talking about when we come to the end. He's not talking about earning your salvation. He's talking about working in the kingdom of God with God himself. It's really miraculous when you think about it. And he says that when you do these things, when you yield to the spirit of God, when you obey and you walk in obedience with God, do you know what happens? He gives this guarantee. He says, you will never stumble. You see, this is what we see. If we walk in this obedience, our faith is secured in the Lord. Look at verse 10. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort. This is the second time we've seen to make effort, to be diligent, to make sure. Why? Because, listen, there is no such thing as a passive faith in the kingdom of God. Your faith does not grow by accident. Your faith will not grow with you being passive in your pursuit of Jesus Christ himself. There is never a time that you are stagnant in your faith. You are either trying to walk apart from Christ in your own power, or you are walking with Christ in the power that he has given you. And this path, when you walk in obedience, you are secured. This is what Peter says, you will never stumble. Wouldn't you love to say that you can walk through life without stumbling? See, this doesn't mean that if you walk in obedience, then sin is never with you again. Doesn't mean that you have eradicated sin completely from your life, why? Because that will not happen on this side of eternity. You see, what he is talking about is the assurance of your salvation. This is what Peter's really getting at, is that the security that you have is that you will never stumble out of the righteousness of God. You will never stumble out of a right standing because of Jesus Christ. You will never stumble out of your salvation. Why? Because the God of the universe, the same one who holds the sun exactly 93 million miles away is the same God who is holding you in place in his kingdom. And it's not just for today, but it's forevermore. He says, this is why you will never stumble is because we serve a God that loves you so much that he doesn't just save you, but he saves you and he keeps you and he make sure that you flourish, and he gives you a path for it. You know, this is really amazing, because then he says this, it's all the way into eternity. Verse 11 says, for in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly, not just provided, it will be richly provided for you. You know, there's a man named Robert, or he goes by Bob, Manry. Robert Manry, he, he decided that he wanted to sail across um, from Massachusetts all the way to London. He wanted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. In 1965, he decided to do this. And it's been done before, but it has never been done on a 13 and a half foot sailboat named Tinkerbell. All right, look, this is Bob on his, his 13 and a half foot boat. Can you believe that this crazy joker said, you know what? I think this boat's good enough to get me across the Atlantic. Listen, there is no amount of money that you could make me sail by myself across the Atlantic in that rig, okay? I mean, it's just not happening. But what, what is interesting is that he said, and he writes this in his book, but by the time he got there, um, all he wanted was a shower, all he wanted was a hotel room because he couldn't sleep during the night because um, who would have thought that on this 13 and a half foot boat that the waves would come over him and he would get knocked off. And so he ended up having to tie himself to the boat in order to stay secured. Well, he finally, on day 78, he finally sees London. He can see it off in the distance. And as he's thinking to himself, man, I just want to sleep. I just want some food. I just want some peace. And the closer and closer he got, the louder and louder the crowds got. 
And the closer he got, the less concerned he was about food. The less concerned he was about sleep, the less concerned he was about just wanting a hotel room and a shower and all these things. Why? Because there were about 300 boats there and about 50,000 people welcoming him into uh, the shore of London. And all of a sudden, those things along the journey that w- kept wiping him off the boat, the things along the journey that kept trying to cut him down and, and wreck him and stop him were no longer in his mind. It was just what is in front of him. And you see, this is what Peter is saying. He's saying, listen, when you keep your eyes in front of you, when you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus for all eternity, listen, the walk there doesn't really matter anymore. The journey there doesn't really matter anymore. The suffering, the trial, the persecution, all that you have to go through, it doesn't matter because there will be a day that you see Jesus face to face and everything in this life is worth it, missing it, denying it, just to be in the unobstructed presence of Jesus Christ. And he says, you will not stumble with this faith, a faith that is deep and a faith that is in the richness of all that God offers you. It begins with your first step to surrender That anchor point, if you don't have it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to grow. If you're not first anchored in salvation, you're not going to grow. You can try all you want to produce fruit in your life. It's not going to happen. And I know that there are many today that you know for a fact that you need to make that step of faith today to just trust Jesus with your life for all eternity by salvation through him. Others of you, you know that your growth is stunted because you just lack obedience. Maybe today, the Lord is just convicting you about maybe what you're not walking in obedience to. Maybe that's baptism. Your first step of obedience in Christ is to be baptized by him. Maybe that's what you need to take. Maybe it's to join our church family. Maybe it's to be saved, but whatever it is, do not leave without doing business with Jesus today so that you will have the endurance of your faith that will never allow you to stumble. Let's pray. Jesus, we are in all of you. And God, we thank you, Father, that you provide a faith God, that we can trust you completely in with our lives. God, we can trust you with our family. We can trust you with our marriage. We can trust you with our job. We can trust you with these uh, trials and tribulation. God, the heartache, the things we walk through. God, whatever it is in life. Because, Father, you ultimately are our prize. Your presence is what we desire. So, Father, would you speak to us now? And God, would you draw us into your presence? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today with our church family here at Green Acres Baptist Church. And this invitation is for you. Maybe God is stirring in your heart right now from what you have heard. Maybe you need to give your life to Jesus. Maybe God is calling you right now for salvation. You know, the Bible is very clear that if we confess with our mouth and if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord the Bible says that you will be saved and so right now you could pray a very simple prayer and just say God I know that I'm a sinner and I need you to come into my life and save me if that's you today we want to help you and walk with you with this decision maybe for others of you uh, maybe you've been saved but maybe you've been waiting to get baptized Uh, maybe you need to figure out what it means to be a member of our church here at Green Acres. Whatever that decision is, we want to come alongside you. And so do us a favor. You can fill out the connect card at gabc.org and one of our team members will be with you very shortly. Whatever it is that God has laid on your heart, we want to walk with you in your growth in Jesus Christ. I look forward to hearing from you soon.